So some of you in the southeast woke up to quite the surprise yesterday morning. A 4.1 magnitude earthquake hit eastern Tennessee and that sent shakes throughout the state and even into places like Georgia and North Carolina. Listen to this one Tennessee family's reaction when they heard the earthquake. Listen. Did we have an earthquake? I believe so. I still feel it rumbling. Yeah. What was There's that? There's no way that was a sonic boom. That's an earthquake. That was an earthquake. Well, I don't know, it never happened. It's pretty wild. Yeah. What a time to be alive though, in something that is as short of a, a time span of an event as an earthquake, to be able to just pull out your phone and start recording. I know, right? And also <laughs> just all of those live cameras in folks' homes nowadays as well. Oh, yeah. But while we're on the topic of this earthquake, we have an expert joining us this morning to provide more in terms of what exactly happened. Dr. Ping, a professor of geophysics at the Georgia Institute of Technology, as well as a seismologist. Dr. Ping, thank you so much for joining us. You recently co-authored a research study on the frequency of earthquakes in the Eastern Tennessee seismic zone. Talk to us a little bit more about this region and what exactly has been going on there recently? Yeah, good morning. Um, so as you know that uh, the earthquake happened yesterday, uh, uh, occurred in this region called uh, the Eastern Tennessee Seismic Zone. And so it's a, uh, it's a seismic zone that is pretty diffused and extended about for about uh, 300 kilometers and across several state lines. Um, and this region has been active. You know, it's, apparently it's not as active as let's say California and other places. But once every few years, we'll get magnitude, you know, three or four earthquakes like what we saw yesterday. So I have a question about earthquakes that happen in the east as compared to earthquakes that happen in the west. You know, a good buddy of mine, he's a meteorologist in North Carolina, Brad Panovich, he tweeted this out yesterday. The idea that it's more common to have an earthquake that you can feel over a large area in the eastern mm -hmm. U.S. Uh, because unlike... Uh, be, because of the bedrock, right? So the seismic waves can travel a lot farther as opposed to the west, which are felt only closer to the epicenter. Is that true? Well, that's actually correct. Uh, and, you know, I'm glad you're uh, uh, describing it in a very accurate way. Basically, as you noted, that the rock here is pretty old, and so they're very competent. So whenever we have, you know, earthquake like a magnitude 4, it will travel much further distances, almost feel like a magnitude 5 on the west coast. And so, wow. Dr. Peng, we know that in terms of, you know, the eastern Tennessee seismic zone, it, it does. It experiences frequent small quakes. But I mm -hmm. would be very curious to know, what is the strongest quake that we have seen in this zone? Wow, that's another great question. Um, so, uh, in terms of instrument recording, that means whenever we have started having, like, modern seismometer, um, it, uh, the largest probably in the f past 50 years would be actually the magnitude 4.8 uh, Fort Penn earthquake that occurred close to the border between um, uh, Alabama and Georgia. That was in 2003. And then uh, if you look more for, uh, uh, closer, um, in 2018, there was a magnitude 4.4 earthquake occur uh, slightly north of what uh, uh, yesterday's epicenter. So uh, uh, as you can see that we typically go get those kind of magnitude four up to five. Now, if you look further back in time, so that's still an area of active research, but uh, you know, uh, the scientists from uh, University of uh, Tennessee has done some uh, trench work recently, and what they found out is that in the past, let's say, 40,000 years, there may be evidence of at least, at least two magnitude six involved earthquakes uh, uh, in that region. So, you know, uh, we may have a possibility to have larger events, uh, but it will have to be spread out in a much longer time period. So what would be the chances of an aftershock here? Like, what's the time frame when an aftershock can happen? Ah, uh, that's another good question. So uh, most times, uh, you know, when you have aftershocks, it will be occurring me immediately afterward. Now, interestingly, so far, if you look at, you know, the USGS website, we have not recorded any aftershock yet. So this is a little bit unusual, but it's also not too surprising because this event turned out to be occurring at about 25 kilometers. This is kind of in the middle to even lower crust. So we typically know that earthquake, the deeper it is, then uh, normally they will have less chance to have aftershocks. So it's not too surprising that so far we haven't uh, recorded or reported any aftershock yet. And so when we think about, you know, moving forward, and obviously we're getting better and better at, you know, kind of being aware that situations like this might occur, what are some of the challenges in interpreting seismic data from, you know, uh, your perspective? And how do these methodologies address the challenges? 
Yes. Uh, so as you pointed out, that we are getting more, you know, or better at uh, recording those events. But I have to say that, uh, you know, uh, that I don't think that's enough if we want to really understand what's going on. For example, like the event we have yesterday, it occurred kind of near, uh, very close to Smoky Mountain National Park. We have some station about five within like 50 or 60 uh, kilometers. But if we have more sensors, then obviously we can detect even smaller events. Uh, so that's one. And the second thing I think it will be uh, interesting is to for us to actually, uh, especially scientists, and sometimes we may want to work with even our general audiences is to understand, you know, uh, uh, if there's a way we can work together. For example, like uh, many of you, uh, uh, including some of my friends, have already filled in forms called, uh, at the USGS called, did you feel it? That turned out to be very important because once you fill the event, uh, you upload the information, and then we can use them to understand again, how far the event uh, will be filled, uh, especially in Central and Eastern U.S., because we don't have, uh, you know, fortunately, as many events as, let's say, on the, on the West Coast. Hey, thanks a lot for your time here. We got to run. Uh, Dr. Peng, uh, we really appreciate you taking some time to share your expertise with us because, you know, we kind of, you, you become kind of the station scientist here. Everybody's yeah. like uh, asking the meteorologist about this. And I'm like, well, I guess we'll look this up. Yeah. Better to bring in an expert like this. I appreciate it. That's Dr. Peng.